your soul, listen to your soul. Eat it, eat it, eat it. Eat it. Let it make, oh, let it make you. That is terrific. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining me and my very special guest. You know her from such shows as Memphis, Les Mis, and Hamilton. Please say hello to my friend, Montego Glover. Hi! Oh, that hi. is such a terrific clip. That's such a feel-good oh. show. And <laughs> what was it like watching that? Oh, uh, like being tossed back in time in the most beautiful way. Like, every time I see a clip from Memphis or I hear something on the cast album or it passes by its face, I go, oh my gosh, it, make, it really makes me stop. And I go, we did that. Oh, we did that. We loved it so much. It's so special to me. It makes me smile. Now you were telling me about your little three-year-old neighbor, right? <laughs> yes. My neighbors have a three-year-old son who has discovered someday. Um, he saw my uh, hand wash challenge, uh, oh. the Broadway hand wash challenge, and his mother was playing it on her computer Well, he heard me singing and he looked at the picture and recognized it as his neighbor Montego, like that's Montego and the singing. And so my neighbor told me about it. And I was like, oh, it's the sweetest thing. I love it when children like honestly respond to music and just to like stimuli that way. So I said, here, here's a, here's a link to the full song from the cast album. Maybe he liked the whole thing. Uh, cut to, it's called Montego song. He likes it played on repeat at least like 20 times a day. And he likes it loud. He always says, mom, dad, louder louder and i literally heard my own voice coming from the other side of the door and him like squealing with you know the light it makes me so happy i love that i knew you had a big fan club at every age and now, you have a and now i have a precious little three-year-old <laughs> well first of all where are you and how are you i am in my beautiful home in brooklyn you and i'm really good i'm really really good um there's something to be said for um having to have this experience, but having it um, in your home, at a place that you love, where you feel safe, that is um, well looked after and in a safe space. And that does just mean so much. Um, and I'm getting so much done, <laughs> getting so much done. I mean, I can't honestly think of another time in my life and in my career where I've had so much unscheduled time. So I'm really using it to get a lot of adulting done, to get all the business done. And, you know, in my life, as a multi-hyphenate actor, um, I, I kind of never stopped working or work at work. So I've been in my booth recording voiceover. I've been doing all kinds of stuff. Well, let's talk about, you know, the New York theater and Broadway shut down on March 12th. Yeah. What yeah. was that day like for you and how did you find out? Um, the day was like really any other day. I mean, we have been hearing the reports, like all of us, have been hearing the reports about the virus and that it was being tracked and so on and so forth. We knew that we were needing to be a little more uh, aware of our positioning body-wise and so on and so forth. But it was like any other day. I remember I was sitting at my desk in my apartment and the phone rang. It was uh, one of our producers and he said, tonight will be our last performance. Broadway's going dark and we have to do the same. And I remember thinking that is the absolute most responsible and courageous thing they could do. I'm glad that we have this notice as a company and let's get to work. Let's celebrate this, this piece because honestly, Richie, it could have been the other way around. Yeah. He could have said last night was your last performance. Don't go to the theater, leave everything there and we'll sort it out at another day. But that was not the case. We actually got to perform one more time right under the gun and then that was the end. Did you have some closure that night with the cast? Absolutely. Mm. You know what I love about you know what I love about actors. You know what I love about theater people is that they know how to call an audible. They know how to like roll with it. And so it was like this unseen glorious force of supporters came forward in, in the name of the MCC theater staff and its producers and helpers came forward. We had an incredible packed house. We had a cast party that was going to be at the end of our extension that moved up to that night on the set so that we could, you know, our company manager along with her staff went out and grabbed all kinds of like libations and snacks and candies for us. And we had a terrific, beautiful, heartfelt closing right on our set minutes after we gave our last performance. And we just got to be with one another and say the things that we want to say before you have to say goodbye for a little while. 
So you were lucky because there are so many shows that didn't get that. So you, you yeah. had been extended. You had your extension. What did you have? A two week extension or? We did. We had a two weeks extension. And by the time we got the closing notice uh, because of the virus, we had four more regular performances and then our extension. So we were well over three fourths of the way through our run. Um, I'm very grateful that we didn't lose any more, but uh, it was a, a real joy to be able to rehearse and develop and preview and open and run our play almost to the very end. Um, yeah. That was a, a gift. Was any, did anybody get sick in your company? Because I know a lot of companies were affected by this and people had shut down, like going to the stage door and yeah. signing and, you know, the theater was sort of prepped for what was happening. No one saw the longevity of it all. But yeah. were you prepped at the theater? Did anybody get anything? Was anybody sick? To my knowledge, no, we were so lucky. To my knowledge, no, but we were also getting reports from Broadway, uh, you know, right over there on 52nd Street and off Broadway, we were getting the reports. So I, the MCC company and the staff and our producers were being very, very vigilant about uh, paying attention to the signs. Do you know what I'm saying? So as the wave was slowly moving, we were, we were reacting. And by the time it got to us, we were already out of harm's way. Yeah. But to my knowledge, no one. Were you able to put structure right into your life right away? Because I've had so many people on here from shows. And the interesting thing is most people were doing musicals and just said, when it happened, I was just so exhausted my body because you're on that train of doing eight shows a week and it's in yes. your muscle memory and you go and you go and you go. So many people said it was daunting for them to comprehend what it was, but they slept for like four days of just <laughs> getting their body back into shape and then say, oh my gosh, you know, what has happened? Because no yeah. one knew that it was going to be, we're in our third month now. Yeah. So were you able to put structure right back in your life or how did it work yeah. out? Maybe? Yeah, I have to say because of the, the way I work and the number of areas I work in, I don't... I, I can't actually function and do what I say yes to, answer all the offers and the contracts. I can't actually do what I need to do if I don't have structure. So even my playtime is scheduled in. Do you know what I mean? Trust me, I'm able to call an audible, but for the most part, truly, I have to, I'm sort of, I, I'm, my friends would say, mm, don't let her fool you. She's, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. she's, she's tasked, you know? So um, the structure actually was like, oh, okay, I know how to do this. What I now have is an expansion of the time. So when I would normally give myself a couple of hours to work on music for that or to read through that script or whatever, I now had like a day. I had just, the, everything just opened up in a really expansive way. And for me, the adjustment was, you don't have to make this happen in you know two hours. You now have a day or half a day to get through that script. So take your time and you know make a cup of coffee and then start reading, do you know what I mean? That kind of thing. But like, you know, I go out one, one day a week. I put a mask on, a hat, <laughs> right. gloves, and I do the whole thing. Yeah. And that was sort of freaking me out early on because the one thing I've realized through all of this is I become hypersensitive to touching anything. You know, you're so unaware, but now I am a touching an elevator button, touching a yeah. doorknob, you know, the all carriage at the grocery store. It's like, you know, yes. you, Tuesday is my day out. That's my <laughs> big day. <laughs> Preston is like my husband. Just big day. Preston puts his gloves on, his mask. He doesn't go out, but we have a, a terrace. He's out there getting ready to wipe everything down, but it's a big day for us. But early on was really scary. Like, what would, like, did that sort of freak you out early on? Did you have everything sent in? Like, what was that like for you? Um, early on, it was more about, okay, you, you know, what is your layout in your apartment? There's only you. You've checked in on your family. You guys have been in touch, so you know what their plan is. Sometimes, I think for us, the worry for yourself is one thing, but then also concern for family members and friends can, can uh, weigh on you. So I wanted to be sure that they had plans and we were in communication and everybody knew that the other person was all right. That's how the Glovers work, right? So that was done. Then it was like, all right, so let's go out and do some proper shopping. Let's make sure that your freezer's stocked. Let's, you know what I mean? And not in a panicked way. That's not how I roll, but just, just go take care of it. Go take care of it. So I looked after provisions. I looked after cleaning supplies. Listen, all of these things are kept in in healthy supply in my home. But just, you know, just bolster. Let's re-up everything, make sure we're really set. And then after that, it was like, all right, what else can you possibly do other than stay informed and check in on other people? So for me, it was definitely action. It was definitely preparedness. But it was, um, there was a calm. And also, you know, I... 
I live in Brooklyn and I feel like sometimes the vibe around Brooklynites is a little calmer in ways only because the layout is different. If you're in Midtown Manhattan, that's such a different energy that's than, where I am. you know, Park Slope. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, <laughs> I feel like Brooklynites were like, we're calm, everybody's aware. I distinctly remember saying and seeing and saying to my friends and family members who were checking on me, the, the temperature in my neighborhood and the neighborhoods around me is very calm. Everybody's aware, clearly aware. They're doing what they need to do, but we're also giving each other space and um, showing uh, support for a larger thing that's going on. And that's only gotten better as we have progressed. So, you, you know, it's so fascinating because I've been talking to Broadway stars who are hunkered down all across the United States. Mm -hmm. And I've had two and three on at the same time. So it's fascinating <laughs> to see how different it is in different parts. Like if you have a backyard, it's only you and your family. So, or you and, you know, you can go out there and breathe fresh air. It's so yeah. interesting to watch how it's affecting different people. Yes. Now, how have you sort of broken up your apartment? Like, you know, is there a workout <laughs> area? Is there like, how is it all broken up? <laughs> yes. Um, my kitchen, at least once a day, turns into a workout studio uh, wherein I practice yoga. I get a, you know, a, a nice cardio workout going on. So the kitchen is now doubling as a place for to prepare delicious meals made with love by myself or to get a good sweat on and, you know, get make sure I at least attempt not to turn into a big beach ball while we're hunkered down. Um, my uh, couch has always been a great place to read, as now uh, bed has become a great place to continue to read. I've sort of made that into a second library sort of area. Um, I love a workspace. I've always had a workspace in any place I've ever lived and where I grew up. So my desk, my home office has become like even more of a, you know, a serve for all kinds of things. Sometimes I'm eating lunch over here. Sometimes yeah. I'm working. But, you know, um, and yeah, I'm also really lucky in my building. We have a roof. So I can go up to the roof and get, you know, a beautiful view and uh, be by myself. It's a small building, too, so I can be by myself and, and um, you know, just have a little time to be alone in a space, but also outside, you know, and not worry that anyone's coming near or going by because we're, we're pretty, pretty small numbers over here. Yeah. I want to talk about voiceover work. Because yeah. you were already doing major voiceovers before this pandemic happened. Do right. you have a voiceover studio in your apartment? I do. I do. My closet doubles as my studio. So it's fully outfitted. I built it in years ago, actually. Um, and so I do a lot of submitting from there. And then I do recording from there, which is a, you know, a terrific, what, what's the word for it? Like, it's just a great little capsule to have right here you know, inside your four walls that I can, you know, I can make recordings and send them anywhere in the country. Um, and I'm also able to patch into other studios so we can really do, uh, you know, final and last records for major projects from right here, which is a great gift. I'm fascinated by that because my sister <laughs> has her house in New Jersey and she yep. turned a walk-in closet or something into her voiceover studio. That's right. So voiceovers seem to be the wave of the future at the moment. I know a lot of stars are like getting busy and mm. people are doing a lot of stuff with just voiceovers, or, you know, with animated and just uh, yeah. books and everything else. That seems to be a big deal right now, isn't it? Yeah, it's really, uh, it's one of those things that I, I feel like for those of us who work in voiceover, it was something you were always doing it's, uh, next to working in the theater or doing concerts, whatever else you're doing. It's always there, especially if you work in commercials as an actor who works in the theater. You just go to those commercial calls, either for voice or for on camera. So that that motion is always there. And if you were um, really progressing and really trying to keep up with the technology, at some point you put a studio in your house because you need it, you know? And so there we are. It's great work too. If you had told me when I was a wee lass in acting school that I would have a career in voiceover, I would have said, preposterous. I'm a theater actress. I'm going to work into theater. <laughs> meanwhile. And, you <laughs> and meanwhile, <laughs> you okay, know. Let's talk about culinary. Like how, how have your chefing mm. skills gotten during all of this? <laughs> I would like to say in some ways I've totally upped my game. And then in other ways I'm like, ah, Beans and Franks today will be fine. You know, like it's it's so swings from like one end to the other. Um, what I do miss and what I love to do is like have a few friends over, you know, once in a while and make something or go to them. So that part has been missing from my my culinary experience. Just, you know, being able to invite a friend or two over.
over and say, hey, I'm making, you know, mussels and fries or something and come hang out and that kind of thing. Um, but it doesn't stop me from enjoying my own cooking. And frankly, I like cooking and yeah. it's it's really therapeutic. Like it just it's so nice to just chop the garlic or just, you know, peel peel the banana, just like really, just really calm down, like everything stopped. Cause there's so much going on right now. There was before the virus, but even now with the information that we're getting about how it's handled, who's passing from it, like so on and so forth, there's a lot to take in. And so those simple things like making yourself a meal quietly and sitting down quietly to enjoy it is precious, you know? Okay, you mentioned beans and franks. <laughs> I want to know what you're, listen, everybody, we're all cooking, but everybody needs, I, like that comfort thing, like I'm not living without mac and cheese or oh, whatever yeah. someone has. What is your go-to, like once a week saying, I'm eating this and I don't really care. I oh my God. Um, I'm going to have a chocolate walnut cookie, usually two, because why have one when you could have two? That's so me. Um, a chocolate walnut cookie. I'm going to have a uh, bread alone, French sourdough bread, grilled cheese. That's gonna be a grilled cheese situation. Um, I'm gonna have avocado on toast once a week. Yeah. And I'm trying to think, those seem to be the things that are like, mm, when I need like a, you know, just a little something to make me super happy. Something yeah. about a grilled cheese, just <laughs> bread, it's cheese, and butter. That we all go after. <laughs> yes, and then like fruits. Like I bought some cherries yesterday, and like, whoo! Like every single one, I was like, celebrate, celebrate! You know, it was like happiness. Literally, every cherry was like a celebration. Yeah. Everybody's gonna be living outside your window, watching <laughs> the, the smell of like you know, grilled cheese on it's sourdough like, bread. On you know, French those, sourdough is so good. Those yes. cookies. Oh. Walked from your house. Oh. Well, you know, I want to go back to um, I want to go back to all the Natalie Portmans. I mean, yeah. like I said, life changing role. You as Ovetta. I have seen everything you have done in New York. You know that from when you yeah. first arrived here. And what I love about your career is everything you do is different. Oh. What? How did this role come about for you? And what did this role? It was a life change. It was a career changer for you, wasn't it? It really was. There was something about about this particular role that really had was just it was uh, everything about it it seemed was like sort of lined up in terms of um i have this idea that i always want to be ready to take on a piece when it's time i want to be as an actress as a person ready to hold a woman this woman whoever she's going to be in my hands when it's time i felt that and i felt that way about every single role i've ever played i felt actually ready even if she was stretching me to my like farthest points, even if I was really having to like use every skill set I've ever had to make her happen, I've always felt like I can do this. It's hard and it's stretching me, but I can do this. Um, and Oveta was very much the same. So I got a call from my um, manager and he was like, listen, there's this new play written by C.A. Johnson. Um, MCC is producing it. And Kate Worski, the director, uh, would like to see you for it. And I was like, that's what Kate, right? She's amazing. I love Kate. I love Kate. Um, and I, I had always loved her work. I had never had an opportunity to work with her. And so this was a wonderful opportunity. Um, I read it and was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I read her and I was like, oh my gosh. And it's, she's so different from me. And then there's some things that I was like, wow, I'm ready though. Like I, this is a woman who I understand what this is. There's a level of maturity that I think you can only have if you've, you know, come to a certain place in your life. So um, I went in, I read, and when we got the call that I had the offer, I was like, oh my gosh, this, I've never done anything like this before. I'm a little bit scared and really excited, like more excited than anything. Um, and I took a dive, but it was, incredible and what a cast you got to work with too i mean yeah. just incredible yes every single one of them i love you know i've been so lucky to do plays that are that are five and six handers you know and these great small things that require a wealth of um knowledge and skill set and just raw delicious talent from their cast because there's a full world and a story to be told here, right? Um, and this one was no different. Incredible company of actors. Um, so made everyone just, just rightly spaced and put in their space for a character and leadership like Kate's as a director 
uh, so great. We were also really lucky, Richie, if I may say, to have our playwright in the room. Um, that's a gift. I mean, you know, we don't always get that. You can put up a, a Shakespeare, but he's not going to be in the room with you. CA was in the room with us and she was so um, gracious and open and generous with her work. She was very interested in hearing from us as a company of actors, as the instruments for these characters. And she was especially open to the, the my vision and her vision and Kate's vision of Oveta. And we were able to really fine tune all the parts of her. And what you saw on the stage was a, a representation of that action, Do you know? Okay, well, you're at an Out of Critics Circle honoree this year. <laughs> yes. For that brilliant performance. And was uh, Patrick Stewart announced you, right? Patrick Stewart announced me. Oh, oh my gosh. Like, it's it was like worlds colliding, like not colliding, like worlds joining in the most wonderful way. My mom is a total Trekkie. And when she saw that, she was like, Jean-Luc, Jean-Luc Picard. I was like, yes, the captain of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Thank your name. <laughs> he said it, he said it, he said it. It was so amazing. What a beautiful surprise. Um, you know, I take on projects because I really want to be a part of them, but it is so beautiful to be recognized for the work because it was absolutely from the soul, from the heart and in, into with the most uh, open hands and open um, heart space, you know? So I, I just so, incredibly honored by it. And for some reason too, receiving that honor in the way that we did in the world that we live in right now was just a magnificent ray of light. It was just a ray of light and continues to be. It was it was wonderful. So my many, many thanks to the nominating committee and the award itself, truly. Thank you. Well, like I said, the Outer Critic Circle decided this year to honor everybody who was in those categories because yeah. we, just, we just thought it was a great way to do it. So congratulations yes. on that. Thank now, you. you. It know, was. Oh, terrific. You know that Memphis remains one of my all-time favorite musicals. <laughs> yeah. And I had your co-star, Chad Kimball, here on you, Wednesday. You did. Um, you know, that role of Felicia. I told him the other day with you, it was that perfect melding of actor and material and mm. yours was the same way with Felicia. What oh, did that too. role and that show mean to you? Oh, oh. there almost aren't any words. Uh, right, right fit, divine, special, ready, feast and growth, like all of those things. She she felt, I remember when I got the draft to come in and read, and I read the script and I was like, I totally understand her. I see this, I see this woman, I see the story, and she's so like me. Um, I, in that moment, when I, I literally had a, a draft in my hand. If I had been able to look up and flash forward to see what was going to ultimately happen with Memphis, I think I would have been blown away. You could have knocked me over with a feather. She is eternally special. She's uh, um, There's a likeness between the two of us, a so, sort of symbiotic energy that I'll never not have. Um, there's something about creating a role for a new piece that particularly a musical, because I feel like there are, you're firing with all the cylinders. You get to use the music, you get to use the lyrics, you get to use the spoken words, you get to use the movement and everything else we have available to us in the theater, but you get all of them and you get to fully code that into her and she gets to code into me. And that's how it feels. Even when I see other actresses, I go, oh my gosh, that's yours, that's yours. And she feels as much mine as she is other people's. And she's, you know, that creation of, of uh, David and Joe's. Now, you know what's interesting? I remember when the marquee went up at the Schubert Theater. No yeah. one knew what Memphis was. Everybody right. thought, oh, maybe this will be one of those quick shows that's gonna come into this theater. Nobody really knew. And then everybody, every critic, every <laughs> audience member fell in love with Memphis. Yay. I mean, and, and you're just, <laughs> it's the 10th anniversary this yes, year? Yes, this year is the 10th anniversary of Memphis winning the Tony Award for Best Musical. Unbelievable. Isn't that nuts? It's so amazing. I'm celebrating today with my Memphis mug. I love that <laughs> mug. No, but it's cute. 
I love shows that came in with no preconceived anything, and all of a sudden everybody just falls in love with it. Word of mouth catches on, and then it becomes this huge hit. That's what I loved about Memphis. Thank you. Or you, you. Did the same way. Thank you. It's, it's we were we at the time what we knew is that every single person involved with the piece um, produced all the way down to, you know, dressers and everybody in our, in our crew, we knew we were working on something that we loved, that we really wanted to put our best selves, our best art, our best skills into. We knew that, and that, but that's all we knew. And we weren't willing yeah. or really able or didn't feel the need necessarily to do any more because that was, the, that was what meant the most to us. So it was great to have that, that energy, that real love of what you do. Um, met with such positive response and people really understanding and embracing um, embracing the work because it was absolute joy for us to be a part of every single time, every single time. And, you know, who, who knew? Who knew? Yeah. Well, superb. Well, you also got to take on the role of Angelica in Linda yes. Well Miranda's <laughs> Little play. <laughs> Hamilton in Chicago. I mean, yes. how magical was that? Stepping into that. Wow, Richie, Richie, Richie. It's it's one of the most incredible pieces of art I have ever worked on. It is a masterpiece. Um, and Angelica is so bright. She's so razor sharp. She's so smart. She's sexy. She's clear. Um, and I, it's to embody her in a way that is so tightly written and put in space is a delightful challenge, like every single time to get it right. And what's great about Lynn's writing, for example, is that she she fast raps. Do you know what I mean? Like she does the spit that like Lafayette does. Like it's, and so it's so indicative of how her mind wrote, how sharp she is. Um, I loved the challenge of her and I loved the storytelling around her. And it, the piece itself is just so beautiful. Like it's, it, it, every piece of the construction is so beautiful. Um, Wow. When I got the call that says, so we'd love for you to join us in Chicago, I went, oh, 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 right. Okay. <laughs> the answer, the answer is yes. Oh my God, what have I done? I can't yeah. wait to get started, you know? Because Hamilton is a train. I, I've spoken to many of the cast members in Hamilton and they're like, once you get on that revolving stage, it is nonstop. <laughs> That's <I> it. <laughs> It's such a hypnotic show to watch, but I'm sure mm -hmm. it's a big challenge to get into your muscle memory and your DNA. I mean, yeah. did you grasp her right away? Do you remember your first performance on stage as yes. Angelica? Yes, yes. Um, I I had been, you know, as, as we are in the world of Hamilton, I had been well rehearsed and done my work as the actor. So I was ready. But it, there is nothing like that first moment where you go, okay, I now have to test all of this in front of people. And you know what's funny about Hamilton? Because the same, I would say the same thing about Les Mis, except Les Mis has had three years to get this space. I feel like Hamilton has made, already gotten there. Um, yeah. Every person in that audience knows every single word. So it's not a make it up situation should you should your mind fly away and it's so tightly written um that if one word is off in lens construction if you say one word it feels strange it feels like you've disturbed the whole the whole structure so like the the like the exactness and the accurateness with which you need to speak, sing, and move on stage because my fellow cast members, my fellow ham fam are a hundred percent correct. That turntable no. forgives no one. No one. <laughs> <laughs> bustle no bustle, buckle shoe, no buckle shoe, you know, prop no prop. You've really got to make a decision on or off that table and please don't hesitate. You know what I mean? Um it was okay, exciting. Because I have spoken to many people about that. They're like, Richie, you don't want to go to the white room. In <laughs> For our audience may not know it's when you go up or you forget the rap or something. And I was wondering, did you ever get the to white the white room? Probably didn't. Because uh, did you ever go to the white room in Hamilton in Chicago? <laughs> I never went to the white room. I did, however, have a moment where I said, I said a word 
that wasn't anywhere in the text. And I, for the rest of the song, I was like, what? It, my brain was literally working in like two spaces and it was like doing this because I was like, that's not right. That's not right. But everything on me was, you know, moving through space, moving through space. I was like, that is not right. And that's crazy. And I remember saying to myself, hey, hey, other, hey, other turn, you got to come back over here because <laughs> you might take a tumble and it's not going to work out. Um, I, one more thing I will say about that first performance and I, it never happened before in a show in this way. Yeah. Um, I feel like the fans of Hamilton are so in love with the piece and so are so like excited and eager. Like the number of stories I heard about how people got there, how they got their tickets, what the, what the occasion was. Yeah. So many occasions Hamilton was a celebratory part of. Um, I remember the lights go down and the minute they did screaming and clapping and yelling as if a rock concert were going to begin. And I thought, wow. They are, they are so right there with us and so ready to take this journey. This will be fun. This will be so scary because it's my first time out doing it. I'm now Angelica, but this is going to be so fun. Yeah. So that was golf. That was really awesome too. You know, I've gotten to meet a lot of the fans because I've, I've gone to Hamilton a few times and got yeah. my family house seats and yeah. met people on stage afterwards. I love the little kids that I'd, I'd like five or six years old or even younger, dressing up as these characters it's and amazing. learning their history. What's been the, like one of your favorite fan moments? Because I'm sure a lot of the New York fans flew to Chicago and then there's I'm sure just <laughs> the Chicago fans. Favorite uh, Hamilton uh, fan moment for you? Or oh goodness. So there was this, this is my favorite one. I re distinctly remember this moment. I was in the, I'd just begun Satisfied oh. and I just started the first rap. And I happened, this never happens, but I happened to look, my, my gaze went down to the first row and I saw this guy sitting in the first row, like, like bawling, oh my gosh, like bawling, like bawling. And he was saying all the words with me. And I thought, oh, oh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And, and he, he was so emotional and so bald, I thought this is for him. I'm going to, this is for him right now. Like, I just want him to, to have everything. So I want this to be especially open. Um, and I remember getting back and after the show, I'm so moved by it. I just, you know, tweeted, my gosh, I just saw the most beautiful thing. Blah, 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 right. So that was a matinee. Fast forward. We do the evening performance. I come out the stage door and I'm going down the line and I'm saying hello to everyone. And this guy takes out his phone and he, to he points to my tweet. He goes, is this me? And I was like, <laughs> It is you. And he was like, ah. <laughs> was like, he had a total, like, crying, beautiful, yeah. like, cathartic moment. And he, he stood there for a moment and just told me his story and, and how much he loved Hamilton, how much he loved Angelica and that song specifically, and why it meant so much to him, and so on and so forth. It was the most incredible thing, because I promise you, Richie, in that tweet, I, not, I didn't describe him specifically yeah. in any way i just said there was a guest in our audience today who was so moved by this and it's touched me and la la that's all i said and i was like you're the best and thank you for being with us he was like this me and i was like it is you and he was like ah <laughs> and it was so dear i couldn't believe it you know lynn has written this incredible life-changing musical because it introduces theater to a lot of people it introduces people to history i mean what this musical has done to the larger scope is absolutely amazing. I don't even think yeah. it can be put into words. Like you said, a lot of people save up for a year or two years yeah, to get tickets. Stories. And, but it also introduces people to the theater. That's one of the most important things. You it know, really is. Many people, yeah. Many people were gonna make their Broadway debuts this season, then the yeah. shutdown happened. Yeah. I'm sure they're gonna come back. I, I wanna be there for all of them when yes. they make their debuts, when this all comes back. But there's nothing like a Broadway debut. It only happens uh, once and they yep. are magical. What do you remember about yours? It was The Color Purple, right? The original production. Yep, original cast, original company of Color Purple. Um, and I just remember- you go on for first? You, Cause you, uh, you were standing by for both Nettie and, and Seely. Mm -hmm. I went for Seely first. You on first. Seely. Okay. Yep. Seely is first. Um, I just remember um, so many things, but one that comes to mind right in this moment, as you were saying those things, I remember the my last callback for the job of standby and having having uh, the director say to me, 
So I just want to be sure that you understand that these, you know, these women live in two halves of a whole. Um, do you feel ready? And I said, yes, I would very much like to do this job. And then I get the job. Fast forward and I start learning the the tracks and learning these roles. And I remember thinking, I I can't, I'm so excited to do this work, but I can't wait to join the world of the play on stage. And so the first time I went on was like a, a kind of excitement, but it was also like one of the rarest experiences that I don't think most people are, are ready for when they go on. Um, I had been, I was going to go on, it was going to be a late replacement because uh, uh, my stage manager was going to have to make the announcement over the PA. And so, you know, they said, uh, and I've told the story so many times, it's crazy because it's just one of those things. Um, and the stage manager said, and so tonight, the role of Seely, usually played by, will be played by Montego Glover. So I heard my name said aloud, and right after my name was said aloud, I heard, boo. And I was like, wow. 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 Nothing really gets you ready for it. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah. uh, it was a moment of like, Whoop. and then I remember my cast coming, flying my sock. And they were like, we can't believe this. Are you OK? Are you OK? I said, I, I am. And I remember saying to this, I just told the story the other day. And I said, do you trust me? And they said, yes, we do. I'm on for Celie. She's, she's the heartbeat of the show. I said, OK, let's let's do it. Let's just do this. And we did. And they were talk about the community around you, literally standing shoulder to shoulder with you. I remember taking bows. Celie goes last and the scrim came up and I lifted my head and there was just applause. And it was just a beautiful thing to think that like started the evening started this way and it ended this way. Uh, but talk about a, a Broadway debut. Amazing. but Also a first time on. Wow. And then I know you went on for Nettie and some weeks you did both of them together, sort of like, right? Yeah. Same week? Oh, 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 talk same week. Are you kidding? Richie Ridge, this is the Broadway. Matinee, Nettie. Evening performance, Seely. <laughs> Matinee, Seely. Evening performance, Nettie. Easy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. What was that first double day like? What was that like? <laughs> you know what? Like, who am I? <laughs> Who am I? Uh, you know something? I think every, this is, not, I don't think I know. Every actor has the process. You know what I mean? How you learn, what you need to learn. Especially if your job is to learn only one thing, you have a process for that. If your job is to know more than one thing in a show, there's a process for that. I certainly had one. And it was my first time doing work like that. I had never stood by before. It's my first Broadway show, right? So my method for them were actually separate skins that lived right next to each other. So I had a Seely binder with her whole Bible and every note I needed. I had a Nettie binder with everything I needed for her and they were separate so that I could literally change brains um, and give myself some markers for, uh, for the deck and for the path. It mentally and emotionally, I needed to rock. But there, that was the way I did it. And frankly, there was something, I so identified with both of those women, but in separate, heart spaces and so it made it easy to turn the corner and then turn the corner and then turn the corner again i do feel like and i said this before and i really mean it i got that job i got my first broadway show when i was actually ready to do that work i think it would have been a very different story if i had not been ready as a professional as a person as a as a young woman like i just wouldn't have been yeah up to the challenge and i think i was and that helped me get the work done Beautiful. You know, we talked about who am I, which leads us into <laughs> Les Mis. I mean, that was a good segue. You, you got to this. Fontaine, was that, it, was that like a bucket list role for you? It was a bucket list that I didn't even know was a bucket list. Do you know? Like, I, I, I did. It was, there were so many moments in that process from the moment I got the call from my agent until the second I stepped on the deck the first time in the company of Les Miserables on Broadway, playing Fontaine. Like it was just, I had no idea. And it's magnificent, magnificent. Uh, another masterpiece, like a just, and so beloved by its fans and by people who love the theater and love storytelling and Hugo and the, the characters. Um, oh, it just gave me such, there was a depth and a, and a total expanse about that storytelling that, 
um, I had never really been exposed to from that point of view. I mean, people come from all over the world to see Les Mis on Broadway. It is, and it's been with us. It's been in the canon for what, 30 years now or a little more? That it's, there are whole generations of, you know, actors and, and, and musicians and writers and artists across all media that, that have been exposed to this piece and respond to it so richly. So having those audiences with us, loving the piece so much and loving that we were so good to it and so careful. Uh, and she is, <sighs> your heart, do you know what I mean? Like the way even Hugo talks about her in the novel is magnificent. You just, you t I, I just gobbled all of that up when I reread for, for the show. Yeah preparation. Yeah, Fontaine. Huh. Well, that was a, a great season for you because you did two Broadway shows in that season because you had just finished up It Should Have Been You, Yes, I love. We have to give a big <laughs> shout out to Brian Hargrove and yes. Barbara Anselmi. That's and right. Course, David Hyde Pierce, that incredible cast. I mean, yes. What a fun role you got to play in that. Funny, comedic, I mean, <laughs> I love that show. I, we, yeah. oh my gosh, Richie, we had so much fun. I think people yeah. would be like, might be a little mad at us to know that we were actually like earning a living, having that much fun with each other. Yeah. Um, David Hyde Pierce is an absolute genius and having him at the helm and then the, <laughs> this company of 13 just nutballs who are extraordinarily <laughs> talented. We had so much fun. It was ridiculous. Um, and, and also making something new. That was a comedy. Yeah. And at the very center of it is this huge beating heart. Really, yeah. a, a comedy, a play about all the nerves and all the madness, but a comedy, a play about love and loving someone and what that looks like, really looks like, can look like, so on and so forth. So much fun. So yes. And being invited to be a part of it. Oh God, you know. Yes, a I remember when, yeah, I mean that reminded me of, and I mean this in the best way, an old-fashioned fun musical comedy that I used to see when I was in the in the 70s. Yes. And I would go to see like first date was the same thing, yes. where you just get entertained and you watch all these incredible stars, all these yes. actors on stage. You don't have to think about a lot of stuff. You follow the <laughs> classics, great thing that Brian and Barbara wrote. You know, and I thought, I remember when your publicist, Lisa Goldberg, said, we're going to go to a dress shop. Isn't that where the meet and greet was? Yeah, yeah, just a dress and shop, you know. A wedding dress shop, and you were all having the time of your life that day. And I thought, what a company, because I was watching you before I had David on camera, before I had you, before oh. I had Tyne and, and everybody else. I was like, this company looks like they're having the time of their life working on this project. We really, really were. And you're right. Like there was something great about like 90 minutes of just comedy, like come in and just chuckle, have some good laughs, have some great surprises, have like, be like, oh, you know what I mean? And at the day you go, at the end of the day, you're going to a wedding. You know, it's gonna yeah. be a wedding. It's gonna be, oh, you know, and we're gonna have a great time. We loved that. We loved having that yeah. um, to offer. We loved having that to offer our audiences. We loved being able to tell the story in our various ways um, and being allowed to do it. It was such a free and, and fun and fun space. Really, we're all so grateful to, to Daryl Roth because she just you know, said, I, I want to do this. I want to make this. And I want you all to be a part of it. You know, so She and David made it happen. It was beautiful. We had a great yeah. time. You know, I love messages and everything else, but I also love going to the theater just to be entertained, to yes. lose myself for 90 yes. minutes or two hours or two, or and, two hours. Hours yeah. and laugh and just listen to the songs <laughs> and watch people hone their comedy bits and just work the magic and all this stuff. It's so refreshing to like dance out onto the street and then run to Sardis or Joe Allen or <laughs> something like and that. Have a nice play. cocktail. Have a <laughs> I know. But you know, another fabulous you did the Royal up at Lincoln Center. Lincoln Center, I mean, yes. What, what another incredible change for you, the role of Nina, right? Yes, talk about a change. Talk about a, a change, a, a very different world from It Should Have Been You and then yeah. Les Mis after that and then the Royale, like but varied uh, uh, worlds and varied stories in those worlds. Um, the Royale is an extraordinary Play. I, I, I still can't believe that it's, you know, what, four or five characters, four characters yeah. um, and six scenes. The entire play is six scenes and the 
Marco's writing, Marco Ramirez, a playwright, his writing, this thing is like the, the richness of it, but the musicality of the language, the style of storytelling is so um, engaging. Um, and it was my first opportunity, no, not that's not absolutely not true. My first opportunity in New York, but my second opportunity to work under Rachel Chafkin as director. And she is, I mean, the bee's knees, there's yeah. more, there's so much more, but I'm gonna go with bee's knees extraordinaire. <laughs> like beyond, beyond, beyond. I love um, that, yeah. Having her, having her in this company and Lincoln Center is such a place for making beautiful, important, necessary, um, engaging art, which is not to say that any other space is not that, but the, you know, having a chance to, those, those halls too are quite hallowed and it's, it was my joy and my privilege to be there and working, you know, in thrust, working in the round is such a wonderful space. The new house is a beautiful space. Um, it was great. Hey, who knew that this play about boxing, <laughs> about yeah. a heavyweight champ, you know what I mean? was gonna in incorporate the life of this woman and that I was gonna have the opportunity to, to really engage in the storytelling in this way because it, that play will never not be a jewel in the crown. It's stunning. Yeah, the Royale was really great. Before I saw it, I didn't realize it was based on the same story that the Great White Hope that James Earl Jones right. played. So, you know, I didn't want, I, sometimes I don't like to read about anything before I go to a show. And yeah. I, I looked at the playbill, I'm like, oh my gosh, I am yeah. fascinated with the Great White Hope growing yes. up. And Jane Alexander and, and James Earl Jones and how, yeah. you know, life changing that play and that film was. And I loved this play and uh, just watching your performance you've always gone after these very strong but just different types of women that just <laughs> somehow always come out the other end whatever they're going through like even <laughs> Oveta or whatever no. else she's still a very strong woman yeah you get that Do you look for certain things when you go after a role is it is it something you've never done before or is it the writing like what attracts you to these women i what attracts me is my response. I, I, I read something and I, and I say to myself, I understand this, there's a story to tell. And if I can say yeah. those words, really simple, it, in the quiet space, and I always read in a place that's quiet when my agent manager says, read this, I always read in a space that's quiet that will allow me to focus. And when I'm done, if I can say to myself, I understand this and or there is a story to tell, I know I'm onto something. If I respond, like my artist heart responds to it because there are things that like, you know, everything isn't for everyone and I recognize that, you know? And and I, I think part of being a mature actor um, is recognizing what you, what you respond to and knowing that if you don't respond to it, it doesn't mean that it's not great or it's not for someone. It just may not be where you can serve it best. I always wanna serve, um, the the piece. I always want to feel like I can serve this, not be in front of it, not be the star of it. That's I'm so not interested in that. What I'm interested in is serving the storytelling. And when I see that it can be, you know, the story to tell, I understand that's what I'm looking for. That's great. You know, you have this beautifully well-rounded career. You move effortlessly between musicals and dramas. TV and film. We have to talk about the new Shonda Rhyme series. Okay. You're doing a part of on Netflix, which is inventing <laughs> Anna. I yes. mean, everyone is obsessed with her. We all fell in love with all of her TV shows. And now yes. we all can't wait for the Netflix show without giving anything away, right. except for you know the thousands and thousands that will be watching this. <laughs> What can you tell us about who you play or anything about the series? Okay, what can I tell you? Because you know I can't tell you anything, right? So let me think, what can I tell you? Yeah. I can tell you that, um, oh, mm -hmm. Shonda's like writing and the people she brings into the room have this way of pulling storytelling together that is like, that's got an energy behind it, that's got a, a sharpness and can change and move and pivot in incredible ways. Um, in more than one of our uh, table reads, production reads, I would look around the table and go, this is an incredible group of actors also. So she, it's the, it's the subject matter, it's the storytelling, and then she gets people in the room who just get it. You know what I mean? Like they, they, they are fine tuned for what that needs to be. And it's so great to be a part of. Um, 
a lot of the show, most of it actually is shot in New York, which is wonderful. I always, for some reason, I, I embrace things, you know, shot in New York, you know what I mean, shot in New York. Like the fact that we're just shooting here um, and some, yeah. of those, some of those are locations here. I love that the subject matter is interesting, a story that's not been told in a dramatic space before. Um, and I think it'll be a real ride and really engaging. Um, yeah, and I feel like there's gonna be a, 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 it's gonna set the space for more coming from her, uh, especially with Netflix. I feel like there's gonna be a, a really great, um, uh, we're gonna establish this wonderful space where we can just look for the next terrific idea coming from, terrific idea coming from her. And I would love to tell you who I play, but it's a surprise. So I have okay. to hold on to it. I've been looking all over the internet. I've been typing in you and Shonda Rhimes and Jason Canada and Netflix. And I'm like, they're all really sketchy out there. They're sketchy. Out there. They won't tell anybody. We can't tell. We can't talk about it. We can't talk about it. But in the best possible way, only because... Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's, you're, I think the, the, the journey, the ride of this piece, um, of this series is going to be so fun that we're, we're going to love the idea that you're just going to discover us coming into frame, coming into view, um, in, in surprising and, uh, sometimes just nutty ways, but it's great. It's really, really great. And I love, I love being, uh, in the world of Shonda Land. It's great. Yeah. Well, you know, it gives us something to look forward to. It's like, oh my gosh, it'll eventually happen. All of this <laughs> will eventually show up. Like, here is the date. This is going to kick off. Yeah. Um, you, you know, I love to ask stage actors, you know, when you branched into TV, did you grasp that medium right away? Because a lot of stage actors are like, no, someone <laughs> talked me through it. I, I, you know, right. the camera was not my friend early on. I mean, mm -hmm. like, what was your first, you know, rendezvous into TV. Do you remember that first <laughs> set you were on and did you grasp it right away? I do. I, the very, yes, yes. And I, I remember my first experience with TV was on location, actually. We were not in the studio. It was Law and Order. You live in New York City. You might have to do a Everybody Law and Order. <laughs> I don't care who they play. They're all about the law and order. <laughs> law and order. Um, wow. Yes. So Law and Order, we were on location, not um, at the studio. And yeah. I remember thinking, OK, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. And the advice that one of my uh, first agents in New York gave me, which I because I was in his office, um, you know, sort of actor talking about, you know, really loving the theater and wanting to always have my career in the theater. But should I get TV opportunities? You know, this is a billion years ago. TV opportunities how I feel, what I do, blah, blah, blah. and he stopped me in the middle of my like, you know, actor moment. And he said, listen, if you can act, you can act. Can you act? And I said, yes. And he goes, you can act. And so I remember thinking that when I got to set, calm, stay calm. You know how to ask questions. You know how to observe. You know how to take notes. You know how to listen closely. So do that. And if I had any questions, I felt really good about like reaching out to my second AD or my first and just, you know, getting a few bits here and there. And it was it was a really pleasant and wonderful experience, I have to say. Um, and I got to say, before I landed on a TV show, I had done commercials, um, yeah. TV commercials. And so being on camera didn't feel entirely strange because there's nothing in some ways stranger than shooting a TV commercial because you're talking about the weirdest stuff and you're holding things in the weirdest way. Like, you know, there's no way to necessarily, um, you know, endow it in any incredible way. You just need to understand what it is and then be present for that, whatever layers those are. And so I felt like that sort of translated in a good way, but it was great. Law and order on location. Who did you play? Who did you play and who was your scene with? Oh, my scene was with, it was when, uh, uh, what's his name? Anthony Anderson. Is he the, is he the guy who's the lead actor on Blackish? That actor was a detective and I'm, oh, I'm, I'm so dead right now because it was when he and his partner were on and yeah. they were investigating and they went to this hotel in Midtown because that's where the next lead was bringing them. And when they got to the reception desk, who do you know yours truly is behind that desk? And she's just, you know how Lauren Order is. You're just like doing yeah. things and talking yeah. to them and not really needing to, 
be taught. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a nice, had some nice activities behind my desk, you know, so on and so forth. Yep. That's it. That's it. I still have that clip in my it. archives. Oh, you need that. It's like, <laughs> that's like a badge of honor. It's like, because so many people were sweating saying, I still haven't been asked. I, you know, God, it's like, terrible. I've got Tonys. I've got Emmys. I should have, no yes. One's asked me to be on Law and Order. No one's asked me to be on Law and Order. I'm telling you, I don't know what it is, but we, it's like an unspoken thing. Like, have you done, no. you know what I mean? Oh, no. I know. Well, listen, you've done so many incredible series. The following, you've done White Collar. <laughs> you've done so much incredible TV. But as we get ready to close out, you got one of the best bits of advice from your father. Do you remember what he told you? It's something you live by today. Ooh, there's so many nuggets from dad, dear old dad. Um, is this one um, about, does it involve a path? Does it involve yes, the word path? Yes, it does. Yes, it You're does. <laughs> yes. My dad is good. He's good. Yeah. He's good. Yes, my father said to me many, many, many years ago, and I have never, ever forgotten this. He said, do not let anyone pull you off your path. I mean, wow. Simple, yeah. but fabulous. Because I'll tell you, Gina cool. Rivera has the same thing. Her, Doris Jones, her um, dance teacher, took her mm -hmm. to New York when she had an audition for the School of American Ballet with Balanchine, and she got really nervous. And, and she said, Cheetah, you know yourself. Stay in your lane. She's always said, which is the same thing, don't get off your path. Hers was stay in your lane. Stay and right you know, because that's how dancers are, you stay in your lane or your line or whatever, but yes. never stray from that that lane or your path. And I'm sure you listen to that a lot, and I'm sure it just resonates in your mind. Yes. And the more I grow as a person, as an yeah. artist, as a citizen, the more profound that meaning is. Yeah. You know, really. Um it has it has been a real gift. Uh, they've gotten so many. I'm so lucky. Um, but that has been a real gift to me every single every single time it's come around and it comes around often, you know? Yeah. yeah. My final question for you is what have you learned about yourself during this shutdown stay at home? Oh, it's it's the, it's things that I've been reminded of. And I'm so grateful for that, um, that I love where I live. I feel safe and embraced where I live. Yeah. I love my city um, and I am connected. I'm connected. Uh, if I'm not, I'm connected, I'm not alone. And I like being with myself. Yeah. 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 So That's I'm getting I think this a lot of people have found during this time, they've yeah. learned to be with themselves. Yeah. And I think when the new now comes back, I think people are going to be just very connected with the one person they're talking to and not worrying about what's going to happen a week or a month <laughs> down the line. It's going to be that physical contact and saying, please breathe on me. Yes. I know you like to share some time together. Let's share some time together. It's great. It just reinv it's given me an opportunity to reinvest in that, to reinvest yeah. in those relationships and to have the expanse of time to let me reach a little farther in ways that I probably wouldn't make as much time for before. It's just given me the value of that and being able to do it from a safe space and be alone with my thoughts and recenter. You know, it's interesting. I'm an ambassador for the New York Pops uh, yeah. education. And one of the things the Pops said, you know, would you be interested, uh, Stephen Reinecke, the maestro, has put together one himself. Would you be interested in putting together um, a playlist called Morning Music? My morning music, like those things that those those tunes you play in the morning to just help you get there. And one of them is a song about centering. It's called Hour of Love. And it's just about getting still, getting quiet and remembering to be grateful and thoughtful and mindful so that you can give all of those things to the people and the things in the world around you. That's what this time is allowing me to do. That is beautiful. I want to thank our audience for tuning in. And you Thanks, know, guys. if anybody has a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars, if you're ever thinking of donating anything, please think of broadwaycares.org because yes, is, they they lost their six weeks of fundraising this time period. They usually do, yes. you know, they collect money at the theaters, and they normally would have raised over six million dollars at this time period, but they're very close to that. They've already raised five, a little bit more than $5 million with their COVID-19 emergency assistance online fund. And they've given all that money already, over $5 million to the Actors Fund. 
That's amazing. BCEFA. Tonight, they are streaming Cheetah, a legendary celebration. The one night only evening of song and dance celebrating the legendary Cheetah Rivera at 8 p.m. tonight, benefiting Broadway Cares and their emergency efforts. And I'll be interviewing Cheetah yeah. remotely from my house and her house. <laughs> so tune in tonight. Just go to broadwaycares.org slash Cheetah 2020 and watch that tonight at 8 p.m. Montego, I could talk to you forever, my friend, just so you know that. I mean, I can't wait to go out with you I for a lunch dinner where we can just be at the table <laughs> and just shoot the breeze. This yes. has flown by so quickly. It has. Like I say, everybody out there, stay safe, wash your hands, and we'll all be back when the theater is back, bigger and better than ever. Montego, I love you, my friend. Oh, We're going to close you. out with another clip from your award-winning performance <laughs> as Felicia in the incredible musical Memphis. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs> The name is Huey Calhoun. Good night and hockadoo. You're